At Kroger, we want our fresh produce to meet your expectations, which is why we're dedicated to doing up to a 27-point inspection on our fruits and veggies, checking for things like scarring. In fact, only the best produce like zesty oranges and crisp carrots reach our shelves. Because when it comes to fresh, our higher standards mean fresher produce. Kroger, fresh for everyone. Save big on your favorites with the buy five or more, save a dollar each sale. Simply buy five or more participating items and save a dollar each with your card. Kroger, fresh for everyone. I walk a straight line, shackled and chained. Hey everyone, and welcome to this episode of Bloody Angola, a podcast 142 years in the making. The complete story of America's bloodiest prison. And I'm Jim Chapman. And I'm Woody Overton. And y'all, we have got, uh, Woody, I'd say one of the most highly requested stories we've had since we started. Right, I, I agree with you, but I, uh, when people request this, they don't they are thinking about a movie they don't know the real story they they don't and as someone who in preparation of this episode actually watched the movie again i can say yeah it's nothing like it no one well, no doubt you did your research and, and the homework on it and you once again you found out things that i didn't even know but i knew the true story and i knew when i saw the movie it was kind of like two different things put together but this is um, some of the shells are going to be hard to hear, but we always told you it'd be different on Bloody Angola. That's right. So we're going to get to talking today, and we're going to name this episode The Real Dead Man Walking. And, y'all, we're talking about Robert Willie. Okay? So I'm going to start telling you about Faith Colleen Hathaway. Now, Faith was born in Orlando, y'all, in 1961, but she grew up in Mandeville, Louisiana, which Mandeville is about an hour uh, east drive of of Baton Rouge and right across uh, Lake Pontchartrain from New Orleans. And Faith had been around. Her family had traveled a lot. Her family had left uh, Louisiana for a few years and then the mid-1970s to travel, and they spent a lot of time in Ecuador and Haiti. I guess maybe they were doing mission work or something. Yeah, and it, you know, uh, it, primarily mission work. Yeah, well, going to these different countries helped Faith develop a love for uh, learning different languages and sparked her interest in joining the military. And she knew that soldiers who were bilingual were desired and sought after by the U.S. Army at the time. And, and by her senior year of high school, she signed her commitment to join the Army, just like I did, Jim. You know? uh, so immediately following graduation, she was going to get shipped out to basic training. That's it. So on May 21st, 1980, she did just that. Woody Everton, she graduated from high school, and at 18 years old, she had her sights on reporting to active duty. And that was like a week later, on May 28th of 1980, she was to she, report. She's rolling. She's rolling. Just a week after graduation. But sadly, she never made it. 
Yeah. On May 27th, 1980, Faith awoke. She had breakfast at McDonald's in Mandeville, which is a you know smaller town back then. Yeah. Now it's, yeah, it's pretty big. Pretty big. But back then it was it was just a little podunk town. And she did some shopping. She actually shopped for support bras because her recruiter mentioned she's gonna probably need those for basic training. Uh, and she was running out of time to have to report as basic training, as we told you, was, you know, the next day. Right. So she returned to the apartment complex, her mom managed, where her and a friend, they shared a uh, separate unit from her mother and stepfather. Uh, she's 18, and it was the 70s, y'all. It was right. different. Like it was, yeah. You know, now, I, nowadays, yeah. you think about that, and it's like... What? what? Right. I'm not going <laughs> to let my daughter do that. But totally different time, uh, totally different world. Totally. And uh, she decided she wanted to go swimming in the in the pool. So she did that. Then she gets dressed. And she had kind of her last day at work before uh, joining basic training. And she worked at a local restaurant. Yeah. You know, the difference between her and I, when I went eight years later, uh I wasn't trying to work in the day before. <laughs> I wasn't either. Her commitment. That's I was, right. I was getting drunk as shit for for probably a, a week before, but yes. the, she. I mean, yeah, she she, she was she was go getter. Worked all the way to to her last day at, uh, at at work, and after working her shift, she had some friends uh, who contacted her. Well, one friend in particular, and she said, "Hey, let's go out for drinks after you get off work. It's your kind of your last night in town." And so that's what they did. They go to a local bar and and uh, celebrate her kind of leaving the next day for basic training. And the next morning comes, and well, that's May the twenty eighth. And Face Mom went to a, a face room or her apartment, whatever you want to call it, it uh, to spend some time with her before her army recruiter uh, showed up to pick her up and bring her to the military bus that would take her to basic training. And when Face Mom opened the bedroom door, she was surprised to see the Face hadn't slept in her bed. And she woke up, Face roommate, and asked her, say, hey, where's Faith at? And her roommate said uh, that she had gone to bed early the night before and hadn't seen Faith since she left for work um, the prior night. Mm -hmm. So Face Mom then calls, now yelling, there was no fit cell phones. Face Mom then calls the friend that Faith had drinks with the night before and she was hoping that Faith had saved the night at her house, but she hadn't. So uh, naturally, what do moms do? Because uh, this wasn't like Faith, right? Her, the, her mom panicked, uh, uh, and she got in contact with Faith's biological father, who lived in New Orleans, and you know, Faith was really tight with him. Um, and she told him, said, hey, I can't find faith and she she never came home evidently so he jumps into action and went straight to the police and reported her missing to both to the Mandeville Police Department and the St. Tammany Parish Sheriff's Office yeah uh, this guy just kind of like got into action dad mode, right? yeah and went dad mode and mom was sort of in a panic understandably and thank God one of them you know uh, uh, could keep a level head long enough right. to to think about what to do. So on the following day, which was Thursday, May 29th, 1980, a multi-state alert was basically put out on her disappearance. And right. by Sunday, uh, personal articles of, of clothing were discovered in a remote 47 acre tract of land in Franklinton, Louisiana, which is about an hour's drive North y'all of Mandeville yeah, where she was in, last seen in Washington parish. Really, really rural. Yeah, very rural. The only thing over there is a paper mill. That's it. And you can smell it yeah, my boat when you're passing out. through. Uh, the belongings were discovered really by mere chance. There was a family. They were picnicking in the area, and their seven-year-old daughter walked up to them, and the daughter had a tube of lipstick. The mother asked her, she said, where did you get that? And the child said, behind a tree. And there's a lot of stuff back oh, there. Lord. So the family kind of goes back there and looks, and they discover a full case of makeup, uh, a bunch of clothing that turned out to be face. And how they kind of knew it was her was they found a billfold with her driver's license in it, and it had some other belongings, which they go straight to Covington, Louisiana, uh, and 
re, uh, return those to the sheriff's office, not realizing at the time that this person was missing. They right. didn't, you know, they were just being good citizens. They know face missing, and now they, you know, know basically you don't get a female doesn't go anywhere without her purse or makeup and uh, the ID and all that, but but her clothes were there. So they jump into action. And a search party was formed on Wednesday, June the 4th, 1980. Face body was found in some thick underbrush, just 200 yards from where her belongings were found five days earlier. Faith had been brutally raped, and her throat had been slashed. Her body was locked up in rigor mortis in a spread eagle position, legs forced open, arms above her head, several severed fingers and this is a sign y'all naturally the severed fingers is a, is a sign that faith tried to defend herself um but ultimately it was futile yeah yeah uh, she had, she had been stabbed repeatedly in the neck with a large knife and had a total of 17 stab wounds and that's like the, um, the cut across her throat was so deep that her necklace was embedded into her flesh. The pathologist who performed the autopsy said that her death was not immediate and, and had to be excruciating. Um, and basically, it's, it took long enough for her to bleed to death. <sighs> it's a horrible, horrible death. Yeah, and, and it's, this is like in the woods, y'all. I mean, you can imagine being out there fighting for your life and somebody just slicing you. 17 stab wounds is a lot, but then you slice the neck so hard that you embed um, the necklace deep into your neck. It's crazy. And it really is. And, and 18 that, years old. 18 years old and uh, just about to leave for, for basic training in the neck, you know, right. the, the morning whole, that all this went down. Life, really. Yeah. yeah. Whole life ahead of you. Now, what no one suspected at the time outside of the police was, uh, well, when Faith's body was found, was that a connection was being made on May 31st, 1980, just three days before the disappearance of Faith Hathaway. Another abduction had taken place in the same area. Mark Brewster, who was 20, parked his car near the Chifuncta River, and that was kind of like a lover's lane. And he had a 16-year-old girlfriend at uh, different time, y'all. Yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> I'm not saying I agree with that, but at right. a different time. It was more common then than now. Uh, two men approached the vehicle. They were armed with guns, and they forced Mark into the trunk of the vehicle while driving to Alabama and repeatedly raping Crazy. his young girlfriend. Now, near Wilcox, Alabama, the two men stopped the vehicle in a wooded area they pull Brewster out of the trunk, they tie him to a tree, and they shoot him twice in the head with a twenty two revolver before slashing his throat and leaving him for dead. That's crazy. It, it, and yeah. Wilcox, Alabama is not a stone's throw from right. here. I mean, no, it's, no, a, it's a way. It's a way. So the two men then drive back to Louisiana, repeatedly raping the young girl again the entire way back originally when the when these two assholes brought the girl back to a third man's trailer in Folsom it, which is basically halfway between Franklinton and Mandeville in Louisiana they were using this trailer as a hideout uh, the man you know the third guy starts making kind of sexual advances towards her obviously these are some real winners right right, right. Uh, however, the girl mentioned at some point that she was raped uh, by the other two guys, and the man starts to panic. And so he goes to the two guys that have really kicked off this whole thing, and he says, look, you got to let this girl go. Right. We're, we're going to be in a shit pile of trouble. Um, so that's, uh, that's what they do. They kind of drove her out to the middle of nowhere and dropped her off. She walks to a nearby home and uh, knocks on the door, beats on the door. The occupants, thank God, grab her and bring her to the police station. Right. And and so on Monday, June the 2nd, miraculously, 
uh, she was able to lead the cops back to the location of Brewster, it, despite having been locked in the, the in the trunk when Brewster was tied to a tree, shot twice, and had his throat slashed. When when police and the girlfriend arrived on the scene on Tuesday, June the third, Brewster was still alive. Y'all. Can you believe that? The, the the other thing about that, I want to say real quick. Not only those injuries that he had, but you're out there in in Alabama in tied to a tree in the middle of the summer. Can you imagine the mosquito bites? I had a case like this. A husband and wife went into the woods around the same time of the year when it was hot like that, and they even brought the cat. They shot the cat, and then he shot her, and then shot himself, and uh, she lived, but. It, when I found it, she didn't even look like a human being because well, she had millions of mosquito bites on her. Oh, my God. And so because Jesus. her heart was still pumping, the mosquitoes were on it. Oh. So this guy, on top of being shot and everything else, had to be just absolutely almost unrecognizable as a, as a human being. Wow. Um, Bruce was immediately brought to the South Alabama University Hospital, and about the time he underwent surgery, three suspects, suspects were arrested in Texarkana, after they were recognized by the composite drawings from descriptions made by Bruce's girlfriend. The suspects were Robert Willie, 21, of Covington, Louisiana, Joseph Vaccaro, 28, of Pearl River, Louisiana, and Thomas Holden, 26, of Folsom, Louisiana. Y'all. Now, upon suspecting that the crimes were related, and one of the crimes taking place across the Louisiana state lines, the FBI was brought in to lead the interrogation. The FBI wasn't having any luck at, at, at interrogating Willie, and he was saying nothing. Um, but a St. Tammany Parish Sheriff's deputy named Donald Duck Sharp had known Willie since childhood and was flown up to Texas Canada to assist in the interrogation. And within 30 minutes of starting to talk to him, y'all, Lieutenant Sharp produced a picture of Faith Hathaway, to which Robert Willie responded. I killed her. When pressed further, uh, Willie say that he didn't actually kill her, that Vaccaro slashed her throat. Lieutenant Sharp then went into the interrogation room uh, with Vaccaro and played the tape of Willie stating that Vaccaro slashed Hathaway's throat, to which Vaccaro denied and say that Willie was lying and that he is the one who, who killed Hathaway. And that's typical interrogation technique, y'all. So. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask you as an in- interrogator. D, is it, it critical to play one against the uh, other? When uh, you have- absolutely. Look, you you think you know, your homies, your ride or dies until the, the, the motherfucker saying, no, uh, uh I killed her, but no, no, actually, I didn't kill her. He killed her. And you go play it for him, and then and it's a he said, he said, and you both getting hooked. Yeah, and I found it interesting that uh, that they had the, the FBI had the wherewithal to actually admit we're not going to get anything out of yeah. this guy. That's got to be hard. I mean, yeah. as an interrogator, you, you think you can get everybody to talk. And- right. Well, the thing about the FBI, and I'm not throwing shade on them, and I've worked with them on task force and everything else, but the, they're experts at federal crimes, okay? They're, they're not expert interrogators. Yeah. Right? But, but they were smart enough to know that they needed to bring somebody in to make that personal connection to get them to start to at least to try to roll. Now, look, I've done it. I've brought in everybody from wives to preachers to high school teachers, whatever the fuck you got to do to get the G's. Absolutely. And this guy having a uh, long history with Willie being that they had known each other since childhood. Right. He, you know, he was, I guess, someone that Willie would have trusted and they felt like he would open up to a little right. more. And how right. about the name? Donald Duck, Duck. Sharp. Yeah. Crazy. Love it, and uh, I wonder if he's still around, St. Tammany. If you are, we'd love to have you on Bloody and Gold. Let's see, in the 80s, so that's what, another 40 something? Maybe so. Yeah, we'd love to have you. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. So, so if uh, any of you are listening to this and actually know him, or you're listening on Facebook and you can find him, shoot him a message, tell him we want him on Bloody and Gold. We'd love to talk to him about right. his experience with all it this. Props up to him for, for for what he does in this case. Hundred percent. Now, Lieutenant Sharp uh, goes back in the room with Willie after he talked to Vicario and played the tape for him, and he says. Uh, 
He says, man, uh, you know, y'all are having conflicting stories here. And he starts pulling out photos, just tons of photos of the murder scene. You know, they're absolutely classic interrogations. Really? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So what? It, what is he aiming for? He's aiming that? for shock value. Oh. And, the, the, and if if you're... If you were truly along and you're not the one is some, somebody's a vicious fucking killer, but some, you know, someone's a leader, someone's a follower. And if you get reached a certain point, you both got both of them saying this and saying that you throw it down in front of them and you try to strike a human emotion being like, Oh shit. Cause a lot of times in our brain, they may have been drunk or whatever, but they don't remember the real damage. And you see it there, and I would assume it been co- color photographs by this time. Um, you see that, and I've used this in so many cases. You see that, and then uh, that'll break most people down. And you're watching for body language, oh, yeah, and how yeah, they yeah. react, yeah, all absolutely. of those sorts of things. Interesting. So he does. He pulls out tons of photos of the murder scene, the body of Faith Hathaway. So he kind of goes through them with Willie and um, – you know, Willie's looking at these pictures and he sees the one with the severed hand, uh, fingers of Hathaway. And he says, you see her fingers? She tried to grab the knife when Joe was trying to cut her. So I reached up and grabbed her hands and I told her to behave. Oh, my God. Yeah, but what a, oh, that's horrible. So Lieutenant Sharp pressed Willie even harder because now he's starting to kind of talk a little bit more. And he takes that advantage and he says, um, you mean you told her to behave while you were cutting her? And Willie responds, yeah. So Willie and Vicario both told Lieutenant Sharp that Faith told them to let her die in peace with Willie stating he did not rape Faith, that she wanted to have sex with him. Oh, yeah, that's why they had to cut her fingers off. Yeah, and Vicario raped her after However, when Lieutenant Sharp goes to Vicario and questions him, he states he couldn't get hard. And although he tried to rape her, he could not get an erection and that Willie did the raping. So it was during. And before we go any further on that, just this quick thought. They actually, you know, that's okay with them. I. I could. I tried to wait, rape her, but I couldn't get hard, so I'm not guilty. Right. And then you got another, the other one saying, "Oh, she wanted me right. to screw her." Right. That's it's crazy. freaking crazy. And they think they're going to get out of this. Yeah. Now it was during Lieutenant Sharp's questioning of Willie that Willie told about a third victim that police were unaware of in the same short period as the other two crimes, where Willie and Vicario on the same night as the Brewster abduction attempted to abduct another woman. She screamed, right. she, she hollered, she went nuts and they kind of drove away. Yeah. And that's, that's probably what you should do in that. If somebody's trying to like, uh, yeah. abduct you, yeah. uh, no matter how old you are, flip out. All right. Fight, you know, fight all you can, but it shows their progression that the, um, that they were they were progressing in in the nature of the crimes and and as seen in this this case it, they grew to the point where they completed it. But yeah, y'all, Willie wasn't any stranger to the cops, and, and he had a long and distinguished arrest record, including auto theft, trespassing, disturbing the peace, criminal damage to property, ag assault, several counts of burglary all before he was even an adult, before he even turned 18. And that's 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 a big deal. Right. I mean, that's yeah. I mean, this it, guy, before he turned 18, right. he had a rap sheet. That's, that's, that's the ones he got arrested for. I tell yeah. you that there's probably, for everyone he got arrested for, there's probably 20 that, that he was never tied to. But, hey, the, uh, Akron doesn't fall far from the tree. So John Willie, who's Willie's dad, uh, um, was serving 27 years in Angola for a bunch of crimes. And in 1954, he went back to Angola for theft of cattle. He was released in, in Angola. Right. Yeah. Hey, I'll tell you what, there's still a law in the books in East Feliciana Parish. If, if you steal cattle, you can be hung. It's not enforceable, but look, I'm but, watching 1923. Yeah. And that's that a sick. big deal back a then, too. You're, you're taking everything from them, right? Yeah. So, y'all. John Willie was released 
And guess what? 1964, he was sent back to Angola again, this time for second-degree murder and received a life sentence. Um, but that sentence got commuted to 10 years, and he was released in 1972. But he then went back to Angola for aggravated battery and was released for the last time in 1983. But not all of Willie's bloodline contained convicts. His great-grandfather, John Avery Willie, was a deputy for 35 years for the St. Tammany Sheriff's Office and his grand and his grandfather for two decades. Yeah, that's that's crazy. Uh, well, that's probably how he knew Donald Duck. Somewhere along that line, that bloodline changed from heroes to convicts. Yeah, I think I actually think there's a very fine line. I think the best cops were probably uh, OG convicts. <laughs> <laughs> they were walking swim. that line. <laughs> swim. Someone who isn't me. I hear you. So. Uh, so just a little history on that to kind of, you know, people a lot of times want to know what the family history was like. Now, the trial for the rape and murder of Faith Hathaway starts. And in court, Willie made kind of easy work on the jurors who were looking to sentence him to death. He was a total asshole. He even stated uh, at one point that Quavis uh, enjoyed being raped, and Quavis was the young lady uh, who was now identified as she was an adult. That was the one who uh, was raped all the way to Alabama, all the way to Alabama, and all the way back. He actually had the balls to say she enjoyed that. Yeah. Uh, Vicario is found guilty, and although the death penalty for Vicario was salt, salt. The jerk. At Kroger, we want our fresh produce to meet your expectations, which is why we're dedicated to doing up to a 27-point inspection on our fruits and veggies, checking for things like scarring. In fact, only the best produce like zesty oranges and crisp carrots reach our shelves. Because when it comes to fresh, our higher standards mean fresher produce. Kroger, fresh for everyone. Save big on your favorites with the buy five or more, save a dollar each sale. Simply buy five or more participating items and save a dollar each with your card. Kroger, fresh for everyone. He was not unanimous in the death penalty, and Vicario receives a life sentence. And back then, you didn't have; to, you only had to have ten out of twelve to get a guilty verdict. But on uh, a death penalty case, if you're going, there's two separate phases. You have the trial phase, and he was found guilty for it would have been first degree murder, and then then you go into the penalty phase. And that for the penalty phase, if you get the death, it's got to be twelve out of twelve. So they, there's somebody felt guilty and doesn't, didn't want some them to die. No doubt about it. Now, uh, Willie's mother, Elizabeth Ullman, who would help her son evade police, uh, pled guilty to accessory after the fact, and she served one year of a five year sentence. That was the one thing uh, in the actual movie Dead Man Walking. They did talk a little bit about her uh, prison sentence for uh, helping him kind of evade police after the fact. So Robert Lee Willie uh, was found guilty of the murder of Faith, and he was sentenced to death. However, there was a technicality. Happens a lot in in cases. You know, it could have been uh, he wasn't read his rights at some point. It's it's. The deal is a death penalty case is scrutinized much harder. I mean, had it been a regular murder case or whatever, probably wouldn't have ever, you know, been looked at so hard that they could actually find a te- technicality. Right. And um, and so no worries because the evidence was stacked against him. He appealed. It had to be retried. And he was again found guilty and sentenced to death. Now, Next up was a trial for Brewster and the 16-year-old Debbie Cuevas, who I just told you about. You see, in the trial for Faith Hathaway, Debbie Cuevas actually testified. She wasn't, uh, you know, obviously she wasn't uh, involved in that court case from a victim standpoint, but she testified maybe to the state of mind of these individuals. It shows that they're beasts. Yes. And that that, um, Hathaway wasn't the only one. 100%. Uh, now, because 
uh, the Bur- because Brewster and Cuevas were taken across state lines, uh, this became a federal case. And under the Federal Kidnapping Act, which was brand new back then uh, in 1980, and basically gave uh, federal court federal courts jurisdiction over any kidnapping that goes over state right. lines. They just have more resources right, right. than your state government. Well, they does. can they can coordinate. You know, that's smart criminals go across state lines because even now with the FBI and this act, but back then, especially because law enforcement agencies didn't have the communication resources they do now. If you go across state line, it makes it harder to get help in another jurisdiction 100 percent. now during the trial willie was up to his old tricks with quavis and in 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 the trial you know where she was going to get justice he's blowing kisses to her he actually would draw his finger across his throat while she would look at him yeah that's how much of a piece of shit this guy was in the middle of the trial and this is where it gets very uh, disgusting. Now, Willie and Vicario were both tried at the same time. Um, all of a sudden, middle of the trial, they both stand up and they say, we want to go ahead and take a plea. Right. So they stand up in court. They take the plea. And the judge says, what do you plead? And they say, yeah, we're guilty. We just wanted to put y'all through this. Looking right at Cuevas, who had to testify in detail about the many rapes she endured at their hands. Yeah. It, I mean, un- that's insane. Yeah. So William Vicario plead guilty to two counts of kidnapping, one count of conspiracy to kidnapping, and they both really receive life sentences. Now, um, although Brewster did live, he was partially paralyzed after yeah. the incident. Horrible. Holden, you may wonder about, well, what about the guy in the trailer, the third guy? Well, he uh, actually was charged with accessory to federal kidnapping, and he took the coward's way out. He committed suicide in his cell by hanging himself shortly after the trial. Crazy. Yeah, just, yeah. just death everywhere, right? Or hell or jail for him, but um, yeah, hell is probably least, where he's at. It's just crazy. While on death row in bloody Angola, Robert Willie pled guilty to yet another murder um, because he had killed Dennis Hemby. In 1978, Willie and his cousin, Perry Taylor, beat and drowned Dennis Hemby, who was 19 years old to steal weed Hemby had in his possession. Just <laughs> winners. Weed. Right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Probably a bag of weed, right? Not like pounds or something. No. But Dennis Taylor pled guilty to manslaughter in the case and received a 21-year sentence. And Willie pled guilty to secondary murder and received another life sentence. Right? What else? How many life sentences can you do? Willie also confessed to the 1978 murder of Lewis Wagner, who was a St. Tammany Parish Sheriff's deputy, and he implicated three other men. Wagner was killed in retaliation for repeatedly arresting one of the four men. Charges were, were brought against all four, but were dropped against all but Robert Willie after Willie recanted his statement and said the men had nothing to do with the deputy's murder. He pled guilty to secondary murder in that case and received another life sentence. It is alleged that Willie recanted his story after his father told him he had violated the honor code of convicts regarding being a snitch. <laughs> father of the year, right? Father of the year. Snitches get stitches. And, and if all that's not crazy enough, in serial killers, Henry Lee Lucas and Otis Tool confessed to killing Wagner. When they confessed, Willie completely recanted his story again, saying... The only reason he confessed to the murder is he assumed he would stay in the St. Tammany Parish Jail for a trial, which he knew would be easier to escape from than Angola. It's crazy. <laughs> Willie also claimed to kill two other men, one being a hitchhiker and the other being a, um, a brick truck driver. 
He gave no details on the hitchhiker, but said he killed the brick truck driver after robbing him and then disposed of his body in a pond along the interstate in St. Tammany Parish. Absolutely crazy. I, I fuck, I lost how many accounts, how many yeah, murders that a, is. Right total now. serial and, killer. And, yeah, absolutely a serial killer. So, you know, and, and just to back up for a second on something you just mentioned, Woody, and that was the name Otis Toole and Henry Lee Lucas. Right. Uh, we're not going to go into, you know, that's a whole nother episode. We'll tell you all about those jokers, right. but, uh, I will tell you, they were, they were, uh, sexual partners, uh, openly gay serial killers that had confessed to over 250, uh, killings th- throughout their, I guess, r- serial killer reign. And, uh, so, just a whole nother story with those guys. As a matter of fact, Otis Tool is, if you'll remember the Adam Walsh case back, right. you know, I was I was a young buck back then, and that scared me to go play around in a mall yeah. because he got beheaded after being kidnapped from a, I believe it was a Sears department store. Uh, and, of course, his father, uh, John Walsh, became a huge advocate for uh you know the milk carton stuff where you see the kids on right, milk cartons right. that was john walsh that yeah. spearheaded a lot of that whole nother story i'm getting chills thinking about it yeah. because that's important and to also, tell also america's most wanted america's most wanted but otis tool to to sum that up uh is who confessed to that murder and as a matter of fact uh his lover actually confirm that but uh but there'll be more on that in another episode so uh if you've seen the movie dead man walking like i just talked about it's based off of a book and that book was uh written by sister helen prajon right now sister helen prajon's book is centered around the facts of her experience as a spiritual advisor for the Angola condemned. It, and it really is a, an amazing account, y'all. She is, believe it or not, she's still alive. And right. a, a really amazing lady. I think anyone that commits, uh, uh, you know, to religion as she has. And and uh, and in her mind, everything she's doing is, is for good. And right. so who am I to argue with that? But that being said, the movie is very... And I mean very loosely based on the reality of Robert Willie. It's Hollywood, y'all. They didn't want to show accurate accounts of Willie's murders because, let's face it, if you had known what I just told you about this guy, you're not going to feel sorry for him. You're not. At the end of the movie, if you didn't know any better, I almost felt sorry for him. Yeah, that's crazy. Um it, it really is. Now, her work as an advocate against the death penalty, it's known worldwide. And she's 83 years young uh, as of today and resides in the Slidell area, I believe, uh, just an hour from where we're currently recording this episode. So, it's hey. Still St. Tammany Parish. Yeah. Sister Prejean, if you're listening, Woody and I would love to have you on the show. We would love to have you on, sister. I mean, I respect what what she does. Hundred uh, percent. Yeah, I mean, can you imagine? Actually, I, if I if I'm not mistaken, uh, Willie's case was the first one that she actually took a one. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, she was one. young. Right, right. Yeah, and then she. Well, I mean, it was the first. And well, you and you remember exactly right. As a matter of fact. They were kind of like pen pals. You know, she was writing to inmates and had never even met a death row inmate before. And and then went over there and and caught a lot of flag for it. Now, but you think about this cat, Willie, you know, the one thing I think they probably got true in the movie is when he tried to uh, make sexual advances at her. (laughs) He's he's a fucking animal. Let's go to Robert Willie's execution. Uh, Right before Robert Willie's execution, John Willie who's the dad, said his son deserved to die and that Vicario should be executed along with him. Father of the year. He said, if a man did me wrong, I'd have no problem with killing him like I'd kill that chicken out there, he said. But I could never do anything to hurt a woman, a child, or a young person. Right? Because you got to have some morals. Huh? <laughs> yeah. yeah. When Faith's parents, Vernon and Elizabeth Harvey, went to John's home and asked him if he believed in capital punishment, he said he was willing to pull the switch himself. 
Well, you know what? If he'd been a better daddy, they would have never had to ask him that question. But Robert Willie's grandfather, a former sheriff, also said his grandson most likely deserved to die. He said, it's like her life was precious to her, and he took it, and they ought to take his life, Keaton Willie said. Uh, Vernon Harvey admitted that he had twice considered killing Willie during the trial. Good for you, Vernon. Yeah, I I think everybody, you know, that has to sit there, a kid's murder trial, thinks that too. But, yeah. But he said in the courtroom during his second sentencing trial, the deputy sheriff was standing less than two feet in front of me with his unstrapped holster three fifty seven Magnum pistol. He said, I thought about stepping up and grabbing it, but there were other people too close to Willie, said Harvey. And on the other occasion, Vernon saw that uh, Willie had federal marshals driving him, and and he considered ramming the car. He said, I, I contemplated ramming a car and trying to push it into the lake, but then I figured the federal marshals hadn't done me any wrong. So Willie was executed on December 28, 1984, and I tell you all, the fires of hell burned a little bit prior to that day. But he was the sixth man to be executed at, at Bloody Angola in a 13-month period, and he rode the lightning, gruesome Gertie style. He was 26 years old. Amen. And, and I'll tell you, uh, before you go any further, in the movie – it's lethal injection he gets. Yeah, he yeah, didn't. He didn't get lethal yeah. injection. He yeah. rode the lightning. Put sponge on that shade head. And yes. Him, Put that him. sponge on As there. Mike Agamemnon would say, it "Killed him. Killed him good. Killed him good." All right. So, but y'all, Willie uh, asked sister uh, Helen Prejean to be with him on the day of his execution. He was also visited by his, his mom and his brothers. Sister Prejean attended the execution at his request. And he winked at her right before they threw the switch. Willie's last meal consisted of fried fish, oysters, shrimp, French fries, and a salad. Prior to his execution, he said to Hathaway's mother and stepfather, Elizabeth and Vern Harvey, who were there as witnesses, y'all, for the prosecution, he said, I hope you get some relief from my death. Killing people is wrong. That's why you put me to death. It makes no difference whether it's citizens, countries, or governments. Killing is wrong. <laughs> well, coming from someone yeah, who would so know, kill more people than we, we even talked about today. But Debbie Cuevas, the teen who endured all those horrible rapes from both Willie and Vaccaro, wrote a book on her experience and stated in the book that Willie never felt remorse. Asking Sister Prejean, did he show any real remorse before he died? which Sister Prejean responded, no. And you know, Debbie, I'm not sure he was capable of that. Good call, yeah, Sister like Prejean. You're probably right. I mean, she would say, at least she was honest about it. Yeah. Um, so, psychopath to the end. J- yeah, really. And and just so many lives affected from it's this guy. Yeah. It just sickens me. So, Debbie Cuevas later married and had a son and daughter. And then as Debbie Morris, she still struggled to come to terms with her experience. She eventually forgave both Willie and Vicario for their crimes against her. And she even wrote a book, y'all. It's in her book, Titled Forgiving the Dead Man Walking, Only One Woman Can Tell the Entire Story. She tells of her spiritual journey. She writes that she had decided to forgive Willie for the crimes he committed. Now, after her book was published, she began writing to Vicario in prison. Though this, through this period, Morris also established a friendship with Sister Prejean. Yeah. Uh, she's a lot more forgiving person than me, I right. can tell you. Right. Uh, Morris opposes capital punishment. She has said in her book that she believed her testimony contributed to Willie's being sentenced to death and executed. Now, Michael L. Varnado, the detective in the case of Faith Hathaway, also wrote a book, and it's called Victims of the Dead Man Walking, and it recounts his views of the case. Yeah, it's crazy. But back, back then, or even when the movie came out, you know, the Books were more widely read than they are now, but these 
would have come out using the, the name of the uh, the movie Dead Man Walking. Sure. So they can tell their side of the story. Absolutely. And it, and look, when this movie came out, and I think uh, I think everybody in that movie won some sort of award. It right. was up for an Academy Award for Best Movie at that time. And uh, so, you, you know, good for these uh, victims to take advantage of that, to yeah. maybe, you know, help their income out and help get their story out. Right, I mean, right. some I'm get sure the, some of them, it was about getting the story out, even more than the yeah, income. And for me, it would be like, what the... You, you know, Holly, you Hollywood it up. Let's tell the real story. Yeah, let's tell. And that's what I love about doing, you know, Bloody Angola is that's what we just gave you. Right. We gave you the real story of who this guy is. I'm sure a lot of you have seen that movie. Yeah. If you're a true crime fan, I'm sure you watched it. Right. Uh, and I can tell you, you're probably like me after I finish this research, and that was. Holy crap! This is nothing like I thought. Yeah. You know, I thought this guy may may have made one mistake in his entire. Oh no, yeah. this guy was a full blown piece of fuck. serial killer, man. Yeah, he just killed so many people, destroyed so many lives, and that's the ones that we know about. But anyway, we want to thank y'all for listening to this episode. Our patron members, you're getting more uh, episodes than probably any other podcast in the history of the world gives. The, the um, we hope you're enjoying them. The y'all, if you want to be a patron member, um, you can go to you can go to Patreon. Just type in Bloody Angola Podcast. It'll pull up, or you can go to the Facebook page. We've got our little link tree there. You click on that, and that's got our links not only to our patron, but all right, of everything. our every everything we pretty much have now. Um, we have different levels on Patreon. It's yeah. everything from our chase team to yes. our cert team to our yeah. tie down the team warden. to the warden team. And, and as it goes up, you get more and more perks. Right. Uh, please go to the, uh, the chase team, uh, or the Patreon team site and you can see what those different membership levels will get you. But it's really the only way we can continue to do the show Yeah, is yeah. through our Patreon team. And then we even have the option if you get the discount um, yeah. if you sign up for a year Annual. at a time. And so we want to thank everybody that's done that. It's uh, that's growing and at, because it's growing and we're getting more Patreon members, we're able to lock up more of these bonus episodes uh, and this one not being one of them obviously but you you're getting way more than i ever heard of in podcasting but so go check it out hey you can't be a patron member we get it we love you anyway um please if you feel so inclined go leave us a review like us remember wherever you listen to the podcast hit subscribe so that way anytime we drop an episode you'll get the notification and it'll be there waiting so you never miss another episode of bloody angola and we want to shout out real quick uh you know each episode we're going to take a different team and we're going to kind of shout out those members so today we want to shout out our cert team members right right straight up and y'all cert team is is our affectionate name for we keep trying to keep it all in the prison names. Cert team basically is a SWAT team. Uh, uh, they're the ones who, who train to respond for everything from cell extractions to uh, hostage situations to whatever special kind of security. Um, and and we do want to mention the cert team perks include ad free episodes. Yes, you get early access to those episodes, obviously, and you also get access to our companion episodes. Right. So this would be considered a regular episode of Bloody Angola. Right. Uh, but you get we, commercial free. You get commercial free and all that as a cert team member, but you also get those companion episodes that are in our Sally Port that we uh, we do all kinds of stuff with. We've got yeah. about 20 different campaigns that we put out. Uh, 15 bucks a month, y'all. And yeah. uh, and you get all those parts with the cert team. And it's love. You get, I mean, you, like Jim said, you can check it out, uh, all the different perks you get. But for $15 a month, uh, if you like Bloody and Goal, you're going to love being a cert team member. So the first one... I want to thank is Miss Tisha Dubrock. Uh, Tisha, we really appreciate you being a CERT team member. Thank you. And we also want to thank Miss Tasha Brown, 
Uh, thank you so much for yes. joining the cert Thanks, team and supporting us. And Tabitha Amon. That's a good, a strong Cajun name. Thank you, Tabitha. We really do appreciate you. And the next one I want to thank, and I'm going to pronounce it uh, both ways. It's either Renee or Rena. Um, so correct, you know, say, make a comment or something below this and correct me. I'm going to go with, uh, I'm not even going to, it's one of those two. I'm going to go last name Walton. Yeah. I'm going to go with Renee. There you I'm go. Walton what he's going, going with Renee. So, so Miss Walton, Ms. we Walton, appreciate yeah. you, uh, so much for supporting us. Thank you. And, uh, Peyton Myers, Peyton, thank you. We appreciate you. Couldn't do it without you. Thank you. All right, and uh, Mamu Wama. I'm say Mimu. All right, Mama. so so you comment too below yeah, that Mimu. and tell us which you one let was us right. Know, uh, who was right? But man. thank you, thank you so much, and Michelle Carter. Thank you, sweetie. We really appreciate you backing us and supporting us. Woody gets all the easy names. Right. <laughs> all right, I'm gonna go with L- Leah. I'm going with Leah too. Fusilay. Fusilay. I'm going with that too. Uh, thank you so much, and let us know if we got it yeah, right. Let us know if we got it right, Liv, but thank you for your support. And he's right, because I got another easy one. <laughs> Catherine Ford, thank you, thank you, thank you. We really do appreciate your support. And this this next one, we know, we know she's well. she's an OG from way back on, right. on everything we do, and that's Miss Jennifer Lamley. Right, Jennifer Dram Lamley, sweetie. We, we know we love you, and uh, thank you for always supporting us. We really do appreciate it. Yeah, so there. Uh, shout out to CERT team members. We appreciate y'all. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. And until next time, I'm Jim Chapman. And I'm Woody Overton. Your host of Bloody and Gola, a podcast 142 years in the making. The complete story of America's bloodiest prison. Peace. Peace. Bloody and Gola is an Envision podcast production in partnership with Workhouse Connect. Music produced and composed by Alfie DeRuin in Studio 433 with vocals by Thomas Kane. Created and hosted by Jim Chapman and Woody Overton. Just ask the Hill String Gang, Rango.